In this week's Torah portion, the narrative of the Torah grinds to a halt. For the past 17 weeks, the Torah has been telling stories from the creation of the world to the exodus from Egypt and the revelation at Sinai. But now in Parshat Mishpatim, the narrative disappears and instead we get a long list of laws. The 53 commandments in Parshat Mishpatim cover a wide range of topics, from the observance of festivals to the separation of milk and meat. But the primary theme of Mishpatim is justice, rules for building a fair society. There are laws about returning lost objects and responsibility for dangerous animals. There are laws about how to treat the stranger and the vulnerable. There are laws for judges and courts. There's an old adage that if you see a rule or a law, it's probably because someone has already tried that. Case and point. Maybe. Fingers crossed. Ah. <laughs> there are clearly some stories there. So this might make one wonder... Where do the laws of Parshat Mishpatim come from? Why are these rules grouped together? Rabbi Ami Silver points out that many of the laws in Parshat Mishpatim contain textual ties or subtle links to the Joseph narrative. For example, there's a law that says if a person opens a pit, or in Hebrew, a boar, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit is responsible. And where have we heard about someone or something being put, falling into a pit before? In the Joseph story, where his brothers throw him into a boar. And what is one of Joseph's nicknames? The ox. Later, in the laws for how to treat Hebrew slaves or the punishments for kidnapping, it's easy to see connections to the Joseph narrative. As Rabbi Silver explains, within the Torah's laws, there's a commentary on those earlier stories showing us where things went wrong and how to repair the mistakes of the past. Joseph experienced so much injustice in his life, and it is only by reading his story that we can fully appreciate the ways that Mishpatim goes about building a just society. Storytelling is central to the work of justice. When we hear stories of people affected by injustice, we can better understand the systems that perpetuate those injustices. As neuroscientist Dr. Emily Fallick explains, stories activate different parts of the brain than facts and figures. Stories help people simulate and understand social experiences they've never personally gone through. Stories are a pathway into empathy, and it is through profound acts of empathy that we can envision a more just and loving society. Two weeks ago, I had the honor to take nine of our synagogue's teens to the Lita Kane Social Justice Seminar in Washington, D.C. For the past four decades, the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, our movement's advocacy and justice arm, has run this fantastic program that brings together teens from all over the country. Beginning on Friday, students spend three days learning about the American legislative process and our movement's approaches to various social justice issues, including economic justice, reproductive freedom, LGBTQ rights, and climate justice. Then, on Monday morning, these well-informed and newly empowered teens go to Capitol Hill and lobby the offices of their senators and representatives on the issues they care passionately about. Lita Kane is the best program that our movement runs for anyone of any age. Sixth graders in the room, I hope you will sign up when you get the chance in 11th or 12th grade. Our participation in this program is made possible in part through the support of several endowment funds, including the Robert Icahn Social Justice Fund, the Florence and Ben Blum Leadership Fund, and the Hoffman Nathan Youth Fund. And it could not happen without Becca Schwartzberg, our youth and young adult engagement coordinator, uh, who works so hard to plan the logistics and make sure our teens have a marvelous experience. You'll get some taste of that if you're going to the sixth grade dinner because she's in charge there too. A major focus of the Lita Kane curriculum is storytelling. Students learn that their personal stories have the power to speak directly to the hearts of their elected officials and reshape their approaches to policy. There's a truth in story that, can, that is beyond debate or partisanship. It's easy to disagree with me about policy, but it's much harder to disagree with me about my lived experience, to deny my story. 
Throughout the weekend, students identify and refine the stories that inspire their connection to social justice. When the teens go to lobby their congressional offices, they read speeches they've written that center these stories. The speeches also contain facts and figures on the issues and Jewish texts that inform our movement's positions, but it is most often the stories that leave a lasting mark. Tonight, I have invited three of our teens to share the stories they told in the offices of Senator Cornyn and Cruz and Representatives Fletcher and Green. I suspect you will find them as moving as I did. Our Temple's teens ended up selecting three vital issues to lobby on anti-Semitism, voting rights, and gun violence. Our anti-Semitism group, made up of Amelia Perry, Eli Freeman, J.J. Silk, and Jonah Miller, spoke about the rising tide of anti-Jewish rhetoric and violence in this country and the impact it is having on our community. Jonah Miller spoke powerfully about our congregation's recent experience with anti-Semitism and was able to connect it both to his own feelings of fear and to broader societal systems that enabled the incident to take place. About one year ago, a woman broke into our synagogue overnight while intoxicated. She caused minor damage around the building, including to a Torah, the most sacred object in our religion. In the morning, she was found and arrested, at which time she revealed that she held anti-Semitic views. After her arrest, she was let out on bail, only to come back to the temple a second time. In both instances, the authorities were slow to respond, likely because they did not fully understand the dangers that anti-Semitism poses to, the Jewish, to Jewish institutions. Due to this incident, my temple has had to implement many new security measures and it was not even just our congregation, as the whole Jewish community was negatively impacted by this event. At my Jewish day school, for example, they too have a considerably larger amount of security present on campus. Because of my participation in primarily Jewish communities, the prevention of anti-Semitism has always been important to me. However, prior to this incident, it never connected as a personal issue and was mainly hypothetical. Since then, my outlook towards the topic has completely changed and I have more of an awareness of anti-Semitic situations. This incident has shown me that Jewish institutions need the resources to be safe and secure and our broader communities need to understand the nature and danger of anti-Semitism. Jonah and his group lobbied for the bipartisan Pray Safe Act that would establish a federal clearinghouse through which faith-based organizations and houses of worship such as ours could access information on security best practices and federal grant programs to improve their security measures. Our second group, made up of Noah Friesen and Larkin Boucher, advocated for the protection of voting rights. In this speech, Larkin reflected on her experience volunteering at the polling place that our congregation hosts as part of our EE Vote civic engagement work. Lita Kane has empowered Larkin to reflect on that experience and transform it into advocacy. I care about voting rights because I've seen that it's harder than it should be to vote. Many people imagine that they can simply show up at a voting center and vote, but sadly, it is not that straightforward. For the past few election cycles, our congregation has served as a polling place, and I had the honor of being asked to be an election clerk. Most of my friends don't even know what that means, but I've gotten to see our democracy up close for three separate elections. Our congregation is right across the street from Rice University, and in the November 2022 election, many of the college students who came to our polling place did not know that they had to register to vote before election day. Therefore, they showed up to vote and were only able to vote provisionally. It disappointed me to know that their votes might not be counted even though they showed up and made the effort to do their civic duty. As a result of this, I realized that even though voting rights have come a long way, not everyone has equal access to vote. Larkin and Noah advocated for the Freedom to Vote Act, which would establish national standards for federal elections in order to increase opportunities for eligible Americans to register to vote, expand early in-person in and mail-in voting, and end partisan gerrymandering. Ethan Taylor, Leah Hoffman, and Dean Miller made up our final group, which lobbied passionately for an end to the gun violence that plagues America. 
Dean offered the story where he spoke of his own experience during a school lockdown that painted a powerful picture of this terrifying experience that is, unfortunately, far too common. Throughout my three years at Mar High School, I've experienced numerous school shooter threats, but this year I experienced my worst one yet. One day in November, I arrived at school slightly late and found myself in the middle of the lockdown on my school's campus after someone called in a threat. While I unknowingly made my usual path up the stairs to my art class, I looked around the building, noticing how empty it was for an early morning. As I got closer to the top of the stairs, I heard an administrator yelling for us to run and find a safe classroom. Before I could even process what they were saying, the sound of footsteps behind me got louder and faster. I never felt more frightened and alone. I felt like I was running down a hallway that seemed like it was just getting longer and longer. When I finally made my way into a classroom, it was crammed into the storage closet. I looked to my teacher for support. All he could tell me was that he never got notification of a drill being scheduled, which made me feel even more terrified. We hid in that storage closet for over two hours. When we finally emerged, the administrators told us to head to class just like everything was normal. I hate that this is our normal. That day, I had two choices. I could leave the room numb and desensitized and treat this as an acceptable part of being a teenager in America, or I could share what I've gone through and push for change. That's why I'm here. This group lobbied for the assault weapons ban, which expired in 2004, to be reinstated as a meaningful way to decrease the incidence of mass shootings in our schools and communities. Many of the students who participated in our Litakane trip are here tonight. I'd like to invite them to stand up. Thank you for going on this journey with us. You represented our congregation so courageously. You brought the fullness of your hearts to the sacred work of justice, and you were so generous with your stories. Telling these stories, the ones we heard tonight, and all the stories you shared over the course of the weekend requires vulnerability and bravery, and your congregation is so proud of you. Yasha Koach. You can be seated. We can clap for them. Okay. And now you have a new story to tell. The story of that time you went to Congress and spoke your truth. When I asked the students to reflect on their experiences, J.J. Silk wrote, Lita Kane was the first program I've ever attended that allowed me to be the change I only ever learned about. Ethan Taylor said the politicians in D.C. normally seem so far away and so important that they would never take time for a normal high school kid like me. The Lita Kane seminar showed you how your voice matters. Leah Hoffman wrote, going to Washington with the rack and spending time with other teens who share my passions was extremely inspiring. Being able to experience this gave me the push I really needed to continue finding ways to change what's happening in the world. I hope that's true, that this will not be the last time these students lift their voices for the cause of justice. And I hope that when you do, you always start by telling your story. As we have learned from Parshat Mishpatim, your stories have the power to change laws. I know that the stories you shared two weeks ago are still echoing in the halls of Congress. In Judaism, whenever we're about to do something holy, we say a blessing. Before we went to our first meeting with Senator Cornyn, we stood in the atrium of the Hart Senate office building and said a blessing because what our students did in Washington, D.C. was holy work. I'd like to end tonight with that blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shenatan Lanu Histam Nut Letakein Et HaOlam. Blessed are you, Adonai, for giving us the opportunity to mend the world. May we all be inspired by these young people to share our stories, and may our stories change the world. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>